Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're hailing from. Welcome to another edition of Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents. I am here with the one and only Scott McBrien. We were just talking about what we're going to do on the show today, Scott, and it seems like a lot of fun to me, but I am an old school Linux admin, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean, honestly, we talk a lot about things like performance and uh, tuning, mm-hmm. and there's been a lot of technologies that have come into our lexicon for doing those things. Yeah. Um, and like, what, three months ago, I think we had Carl Abbott on, who's the experienced product manager for, for operating system performance for RHEL. Mm-hmm. Um, and we talked about performance copilot and Grafana and visualizations and that's all great. And in fact, like the next version of Rome will have even more cool shit like that. Um, but, nice. you know, when I start looking at what um, what's out there, that's not what people find, right? So like visualizations and, and those types of things are really good for stuff like troubleshooting. Right. But let's say that like you are a database server there's stuff that you should be doing to that to adjust the system parameters to optimize it for that database workload and so like visualizations and and data collection and those types of things don't help you with that um and so i i thought we'd start today by just kind of doing a quick round of the contents of slash proc yeah and then um when we were talking before the show I found a couple of tuning guides specifically for database things. Mm -hmm. One that I thought was really good for, for, from Microsoft SQL server running on Linux and another one that is like less good. And we could talk about like why I think it's less good um, for just kind of general database server. Mm -hmm. I I think it may have been even a MySQL one, but it would, it would apply to Postgres or some of the other. Right. Like, yeah, database tuning on Linux, like you can, there are a lot of knobs that you can actually do to make your MySQL or Postgres data, whatever database, uh, to be honest with you, like run better right, out of the but, box, right? Like, yeah. But like when you turn those knobs, and this is the thing that people don't understand, because they'll like read the article and be like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll put these in my 2D. Mm-hmm. Bam, yeah, there yeah. we go. Cool, optimized. Um, you're, you're actually making choices mm. that make this system less good for other things. That's right. Right. That, and that's so what we always tell people, put your database on an independent class of servers, right? Well, and also things like uh, a lot of the tunables will do things like shove as much as they can in memory. So like extending right. the um, file system synchronization values, right? So that your buffered writes stay buffered longer. So that if you need to refer to that data, it's already loaded in, in RAM. Mm-hmm. However, if you were running this database, I don't know, um, on a ship or <laughs> someplace you know, some, disconnected from the world, or, right? Or someplace yeah. that where like there, there may be more likely to be power outages. Um, oh, I mean, if you lose power on that box or it's being run by less trained staff, right? So their solution is pull the plug, plug it back in. Mm. Um, all of a sudden, all those disk writes that you needed to write out to disk. Didn't happen. <sighs> yeah. And then what happens? Like, was that data really critical? In which case it's gone and now you're losing critical data. Mm-hmm. So there are times where it's like, well, okay, so these are the database tuning things. Cool. But for my use case, I need to be aware of these other environmental factors, deployment factors, whatever. Um, so maybe I use some of these things, but not all of these things. And that's, that's something that I think that um, there's still a lot of need for in our industry. Anyway, so let me, let me just pull up my uh, SSH session here. We can dive right on in. Yeah. I like it. All right. So Chris, you assure me that you are a, a uh, RHCSA. I, I mean, I'm not up to date, but yes, I was. I've let it expire. I'm currently Ansible certified and I'll let that expire and then maybe I'll go get open shift, so. I feel you. I, at one point I was a uh, Red Hat certified architect, but that has also kind of whittled down over the years. But, you know, the knowledge doesn't really go away. <laughs> right, right. 
All right. So this is, I'm just SSH into a box mm -hmm. um, and we're currently in slash proc. Yeah, and root. this is what it looks like. Yeah. Um, and you'll recall that proc is really a virtual file system. Yep. So it's not storing disk. We're actually looking at space within the kernel's memory. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I noticed about this is all those oh, numeric numbers. directories. What are yeah. those? Yeah, hmm. that was my question to you, Chris. Oh, you want me to answer that? Yes. Those are PIDs or exactly. process IDs, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so um, let's just look at one of them here. Uh, so this is all about process ID mm -hmm. 610, which... Uh, Cannot read symbolic link 610 EXE. Ooh, what's that? Uh, that is the, um, oh, this guy right here is okay. broken, and right. that's what it's complaining about. That normally is a symbolic link to the executable that was used to create process ID 610. Right. But process ID 610 is apparently this kernel thread. Yeah. And that's why it doesn't have an executable because it's not executed from the file system that's mm. part of the kernel. So maybe I, let's look at a different one. How about um, 61 31. All right, that, that one's more better. More right? better. We look at it. This is a uh, tool for the GNOME desktop right on this box, right? Okay, cool. Okay, uh, so we've seen a lot of the information that's in this directory elsewhere, like, mm -hmm. like the executable name, um, like the, mm, uh, maybe it's that, yeah. command, uh, if we look at the command. Right. And I want to less that or cap that. Um, so this is the actual thing that was executed on the command line to make it. Uh, the AUXV. Uh, so that's actually some maybe binary. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not really much better, is it? Um, and do a file. Can you okay. do file yeah. that until maybe it'll tell you a little bit on that. Oh, oh but it's stored in memory. And right. so yeah, Never mind. as much. Um, <laughs> but some other interesting things, uh, because like a lot of this data we end up seeing other places like PS. Right. So mm -hmm. process status comes in yeah. here and like collects stuff and arranges it in a more human-friendly way because right now it's stored in a very kernel-friendly way. Um, but one of the ones I like a lot is that guy. Whoops, cat. That guy. So, um, do you know what the um score is used by? Uh, out of that's the um killer, I would assume, right? Out of that's right. Management tool or system, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So when your system is out of memory, the uh, out of memory killer, oom killer, mm -hmm. fires up and starts whacking things. And it used to be a- If you see oom killer running in your databases, you've done too much. <laughs> <laughs> You're it's having true. problems. <laughs> you, you have you've gone too far. Yeah. Point of no return past. <laughs> well, like way back in the day, like RHEL 3, RHEL 4, right? The right. 2, 4, 2, 6 kernel. Mm -hmm. uh, um killer would start it would literally just pick a process at random and kill it oh off. yeah totally random and just like right. whack just start whacking stuff right and lo and behold that was not the best way to make decisions mm. yeah. uh, so shocking right so they came up with the scoring method and so now um killer kills the thing with the lowest score there you go and will like work its way up until it uh it has enough memory to continue. But so on this box, on this process here, 6131, OOM score is zero, right? It, and if we looked across all the processes, there's probably a whole bunch that have OOM score zero. So they're all 
equally likely to be killed. But what is this? Ooh. But you can use the Oom adjust to change the process zoom score and thereby make it less likely to get killed by Oom killer. Nice. And so in a production environment, um, we would do this on things like the SSHD processes. Mm -hmm. So you'd like write a script that would run at boot, that would check to see what the process for SSHD was. And then you just like make that Oom score really big. So that if the box had problems, it would kill your database or it'd kill your like web application servers or whatever, but SSH would still be running, which means that as a remote admin, you didn't have to drive to the data center mm -hmm. to do the needful on this box. Like you'd still sit it at home at four in the morning and connect to it and, and fix it. So. So yeah. someone in chat to ask, are we going to talk about FD and NS in this session? Uh, so FD is file descriptors, yes, namespaces, that kind of yes. thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, and no, I wasn't planning on talking about them, but file descriptor is basically like the files that this process has open, right? So you would get that data from things like LSOF um, mm -hmm. to tell you like what, what files are out there that it's using. And then NS I've never really delved into, so I will not um, make things up on what's in there. Fair enough. So. Uh, I will find an article for you, Farhan, if you missed uh, the OOM score stuff. He's asking us to repeat that. But basically, OOM score is a way for OOM killer to figure out what to do. Right. The, the lower the OOM score, the more likely it will be killed in an out-of-memory situation on the box. The higher the OOM score, the less likely it is to be killed. And I know that the... Um, the inclination would be like, oh, this is a database box. I should make the database super resilient to oom killing. No, no, no. That's not what you want. Mm -hmm. um, you want to like make the things that are critical to your administration of this box, the things that are protected from oom killer so that you can connect yes. to it and administer it and not have to reboot it or something else. Because you can always like restart the database processes. Mm -hmm. um, cool. All right, so that's that's a little bit on like the process ID directories. But then there's like all this other stuff too um, that's more system stuff. And so for example, modules, right? So these are all of the uh, kernel modules that are loaded into the running kernel, right? And we would normally access this data with something like LS1, right, to, to show it mm -hmm. to you. And so you're looking at kind of the same data um, just formatted more nicely. So for example, this guy right here, the Intel GDT module is loaded. This is how much memory it's using. This is the um, dependent modules that require this one. And then if you really wanted to, here's the hex memory address of where it lives. I don't, we probably don't care as much about that. Yeah, right? And you'll notice yeah. that like in, um, in the LS mod, it, it actually doesn't show us that. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, this is Linux guts right here, right? <laughs> right, right. And yeah. honestly, like, this is one of the cool things about Linux that yeah. other operating systems, it. yeah. yeah. Um, and we can also look at stuff like, I, actually, I use this one all the time, partitions. So these are all of the file system, sorry, not file system, all of the um, device IDs of disk devices. So we can see that on this machine, I've got an NVMe drive and that has two physical partitions on it. And then I've got three device mapper devices for my logical volume configuration. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I like plug a USB thumb drive into it, I wanna know what device that is. Well, I'll just take another look at cat, uh, proc partitions and it'll say like SDA mm -hmm. or SDB or whatever it is. And then I know what what the device is that I just plugged in. I can reformat it or whatever and not have to worry about destroying my entire box. Uh, and we would get this maybe from something like, uh, like that, maybe, right? And so here it's showing us, uh, that's our NVMe drive 
And then here are the two physical partitions. And then these are the three um, logical volume managed file systems. And we get more data and it's organized a little bit more humanly, right? Um, but if you just want something quick, right? Less data, but it's live updated whenever something changes in the kernel. Right. All right. Um, so again, like we use a lot of this data through other command interfaces. But then there's like super deep stuff. For example. Ooh. Yeah, so these are the uh, interrupts mm -hmm. that are on the machine. And so like back in the day, we would call these IRQs, right? The interrupt request numbers. That's the actual like signal number that is sent when something happens on this device. Um, over here, we're looking, whoops, over here, we're looking at the actual thing that goes with this device. Um, and you'll see that there's like three, uh, four columns for CPU because this is a quad core box. Mm -hmm. And the numbers underneath each of, those, um, each of those columns is how many times this CPU has handled an interrupt to this device. And a lot of times it will be either a CPU gets assigned management of this interrupt. So anything that gets sent to this device or interrupt that occurs on this device, a specific CPU handles. And you can see that that's the case here with uh, interrupt nine, right? The other CPUs aren't handling interrupt nine. But in other cases like this one, um, it gets kind of spread across the CPUs. So um, the handling for this interrupt is more um, equally handled. And this one happens to be for the ethernet card right. on this box. Which makes sense. Um, and so again, this is like troubleshooting type of data. Mm -hmm. where you're interested to see if something is going crazy or, you know, is there one of these that has like a really high number associated with it? So you can see like my system performance is degraded, but look, I'm getting like a lot of interrupts on my ethernet device or my graphics card or my Wi-Fi interface. And so you can kind of uh, get a little bit of data on what, what's happening there. Um, so question and then, in chat. Yes. Tackle it. Um, difference between proc and sys. Ah, so uh, organizationally, or like what they are is not different. They're both in-memory file systems presented to you by the kernel. Mm -hmm. The difference between them is what information goes there. And so if we look at uh, sys, uh, sys is more organized around the devices attached to the mm -hmm. kernel or to the machine rather. Right. And so this is where you'd go to like set the um, scheduling algorithm on a specific block device, right? So I would say that sys is more for interacting with system connected devices, whereas proc is for system information. And then in a, just a bit, we'll start talking about the tunables, but those tunables apply system-wide. They, they typically don't apply to a specific device. Whereas mm -hmm. the stuff in slash sys, would apply to specific um, devices. Nice. All right. Um, so I want to get like super deep for just a second. And, okay. Well, super deep right. for just a second. Yeah. And and let me like roll back. I'll, I'll show you one more like kind of useful one. Actually, let's do two swaps. So you've seen this before, but you probably did something like swap on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dash S, right? So again, we're actually looking at the same data just through a different interface. Um, but I also like MemInfo. Oh yeah, MemInfo is awesome. Right, MemInfo is like all this memory information and we usually interact with it, things like VMstat or free or maybe top. And we'll actually show you some of this information, mm -hmm. but there's a lot more in here than what those tools are showing you. Uh, so for example, um, your huge page allotments, these are typically not shown by a lot of the other memory um, reporting applications. Um, and if you're not familiar, a huge page is uh, a hunk of memory that is 
larger in size than the normal page size on a, on a system, mm -hmm. uh, the huge page size can be changed. And on this system, it's two megabytes. So each one page goes to a two megabyte hunk of memory mm -hmm. as opposed to a 4K hunk of memory, which is what the normal page size is. Cool. Um, also in here, you get things like this guy. Oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so... Um, so what's the commit limit just for everybody out there? Okay, so we often operate in memory over commitment mode on Linux. And the reason that we do that is because when we start up a process, um, it often will share a lot of its overhead with other processes. So for example, if you're running a web server and you've got 30 um, Apache threads or Nginx instances running, um, each one of those loads shared memory, like shared libraries and that kind of thing. Well, how many of those do you really need to load it? Do you need one instance of that library for every single thread that you have going? No, you have one that everybody kind of refers to. But the process itself doesn't know that it's sharing that library with other processes. And so um, we, because we're sharing memory, and we don't report that at the process level. We have to have another way of tracking how much memory we've committed to delivering to processes and how much we're actually delivering to the processes. So the commit limit is how much I will allow processes to ask for across the entirety of the system. So this box I think has eight gig of RAM mm -hmm. and you can see that we're committed, our commit limit is like almost 12 gig of RAM. Or so normally you see us commit to about 50% more memory than we've got. Um, committed as is how much we're currently committed to delivering. So all the processes on the machine, uh, they are currently using up um, eight gig of memory. And that's their reported size, right? So that includes things like shared libraries that might be shared with other people. But they think that they've got eight gig of memory consumed. They think they do. Yes. So, <laughs> so let's go back to one of our processes here. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's a thing in here about DATAM, I believe it is. No, uh, one of these. One of these. So status gives us like more specific um, memory utilization, right down here in like VM data, VM stack, VMXE, that's telling me about what this process is consuming in different types of memory. But what I was looking for was a, I think it's one of the map files. Oh, the map one? GID map? Hmm. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, maps. That's it. There you go. Okay. So um, this is actually telling me the hex memory ID mm -hmm. and what is stored there. Right. And every process, uh, it turns out, is given the same um, memory table. So it thinks that its memory starts at like all zeros and goes until some other hex number. Mm -hmm. But if you looked at every single process, every single process starts at that all zero memory address. Um, but they can't all start there because that would mean that they're all stored in the same actual physical RAM. And so what you may have noticed if you do um, uh, S-trace and look at the system calls that are being made by applications, there's a lot of MMAP system calls. Mm -hmm. MMAP is memory mapping, and it's to kind of be this bridge between, okay, the process said it wants to access this hex value of memory. So we're going to go out to the memory mapping unit in the kernel and see what actual system memory address that maps to. And that's how we actually implement things like shared memory. And so we could store this libuidso file and have everybody refer to it and not know that they're all sharing it because behind the scenes, the MMU is what's actually storing where this shared library lives and then making sure that in the individual processes, it's got the right memory mapping 
So when the process tries to access that memory, mm -hmm. it actually redirects it to the correct system memory. Cool. So there is a question from Mr. Rapscallion Reeves. According to the Gentoo handbook, so take that with a grain of salt, uh, special care needs to be made when mounting, or special care needs to be taken when mounting proc and sys directories, obviously. Um, they suggest using the dash dash r bind and dash dash make our slave options. Could you speak on that? Maybe why they're needed? I don't know, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, I have not seen those options. Mm -mm. Uh, I know that sys and proc are automatically mounted um, into the rel file system. Right. So I don't, uh, let's see here. Oh yeah. So that, that. So unless they are, um, unless they are implied options, mm -hmm. meaning they're used all the time, I don't see them being called out in how we're performing the mount here. Um, so I don't know. Without having the article, I couldn't tell you more about why that is that is suggested by Gentoo. Yeah, I would ping the Gentoo folks and say, hey, why is this <laughs> that way? Well, we can maybe like do some Google searching and see what those options do. Yeah. But not right now. I, I will look it up after the show. How about that? Yeah, fair enough. So let me take a quick note to do that. And maybe maybe next show, I will have a follow-up to uh, provide more detail. Sorry, Arbonne, that was for when mounting the base proc safe. and sys directories into a troop. Maybe it's just because those directories are needed for the host and troop, probably. I mean, this is all done automatically right like this is the value add of rel like you're not building it you know basically from scratch <laughs> you're it, you're kind of just going with the flow here it, and you're right it may be a um because it's a cheroot mm -hmm. that it is needed by both the running operating system but also your cherooted environment um I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was a container -y thing as well but we'll see I'll, I'll see if I can find some information on those and then have a, a more yeah. informed opinion on them. I will uh, at least look up the flags. Uh, um, so I wanted to go like super deep for just a second. I, I know the MMU was like also deep. But, <laughs> uh, all right. So there's so much data here and a lot of it like we get through other tools, but then there's like a bunch of just like, random how the operating system works stuff. And buddy info is an example of one of those. So um, buddy info is broken up into the different zones of memory. Mm. It turns out the kernel when allocating memory uses an algorithm called the buddy algorithm. And the buddy algorithm means, uh, do you have friends nearby that are also available memory pages? So we can see that in uh, the DMA zone, there's very few contiguous individual or contiguous groups of pages together. So like, and I remember, if I remember correctly, like over here, um, these are the pages that are individual where there's no adjacent free page of memory. I may have that backwards because notice there's no labeling on this table. Um, and the next column over is like a group of two pages next to each other. And then the next column over would be a group of four pages next to each other. And so each one of these increases by a power of two and it shows you the contiguous blocks of free memory that are out there available. And I actually do think I am opposite. So no single individual pages, but lots of like hunks of memory. Uh, whereas down here in DMA 32, there's a whole bunch of individual pages, but very few giant hunks of buddies together. Um, and same thing in zone normal. And so like, do you need to know this information? Probably not. But if you're running on a system and it's been up for a really long time, you could use something like this to ask yourself the question, am I dealing with fragmented memory? Right, so if you have like, 
groups of contiguous free buddies, then you have groups of contiguous memory. You're not fragmented. But if you have like onesies in each one of these categories, then that tells you that you have very limited amount of memory in each of these groups of contiguous blocks of memory. Or if you had like all single page reported buddies, right? Where they're just one page standing there by themselves with nobody else around them. That's a more fragmented memory type situation. And the kernel does a whole bunch of stuff to try and keep that from happening, uh, where it'll actually even copy data behind the scenes and try and make more contiguous memory to, to avoid that situation. Nice. The kernel is uh, a smart little thing, isn't it? It is. And uh, it's made smarter or dumber by developers. So <laughs> depends on, on which, which way you want to cut that one. Yeah. Well, you know, people have opinions. Yes. Especially in the kernel community. <laughs> True enough. Sorry, I had to say it. <laughs> True enough. All right. So um, that that's like a lot on proc, probably more than we want to go into on proc. But, but where yeah. I wanted to go with this is like, we're used to seeing this information, but there's more stuff there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're really interested in down and dirty information, you can get even more. Okay. Uh, but the other thing that we often do when interacting with PROC is make changes to it. And at this level, there are very few files that can be changed, right? You can't right. like you go can't into really... meminfo yeah. and update your memory. Right. Like there's commands to do that, right? Like this is just exposing what's there, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but there are a couple of places where you can make changes. So we saw one of those earlier when we were um, messing around with the UMAJUST and that was changing the UM score, right? So that was a, an example. Uh, those changes are not persistent because everything in this directory is in memory. So right. if you read with the machine, it goes back to whatever the value was originally. Which is why uh, you need to, if you want to keep that state, you need to use the proper commands to make that state. Yeah. Right. And so um, one of the places where we do often see changes is proc sys. Yes. So we have a couple of different ways of making changes to the process. One that I'm going to use is just like shoving data in there, but that's not persistent. So uh, we have syscontrol or sysctl.conf. Mm -hmm. um, that is the older method of making these changes persistent. Uh, the newer method is Tundi. So Tundi profiles will actually adjust data here in Proxys. It can also adjust things in slash sys. So Sony was asking earlier about the difference between the two um, file systems. ToonD can actually handle both. Mm. SysCTL only does process. Right. All right. Um, so at the, at the onset of the show, we're talking about databases being one of those things that we often see um, changed. And I wanted to take a look at the... Um, ToonD profile that Microsoft has written a really excellent article on for running uh, SQL Server on Linux. Mm -hmm. and I think you're going to paste it into the. the I'm going to, chat. Uh, but there's a question that I need to ask. Oh, you. yes. Drop caches. Can we talk about that for a second? Mainly the cons of drop caches? Sure. Um, why don't we make that one of our first things that we mess around with in process? So cool. let's hold this like database thing for a second okay. and talk about the mechanics of making changes to process. All right. So if I remember correctly, drop caches is in VM because right? it's a virtual memory thing right there. there. Okay. That's why I couldn't and, the bottom of the first row. Yep. And if we just take a cat on it, currently set to zero, but how do you know what should go in here? Because like, for example, uh, I know that um, swappiness here is a value between zero and 100. And it sets the uh, kernel's affinity for using swap space. Whereas over commit memory is zero, one, or two. I will not over commit memory. I will overcommit memory to a certain ratio, or I will always overcommit memory no matter what. But how do you know that those are the correct values to go in here? 
because they're not all the same. Uh, drop caches is an excellent example of that. So the kernel documentation tells us a lot about these parameters. So um, this is all different types of kernel documentation, but you'll notice that there is a syscontrol subdirectory in the kernel documentation. And then it's broken down by that top level directory hierarchy underneath proxys. So for looking at drop caches, which is in proxys VM, I'm gonna take a look at vm.txt. And I'm gonna look for drop caches. Right, so that's in the uh, list of tunables covered by this document. And then when I look down into it, it says, this is going to cause the kernel to drop caches. But depending on what number you shove into it, tells it what caches you're interested in dropping. So if I put a one into drop caches, it's going to free page cache. If I put a two into drop caches, it's going to re uh, free reclaimable slab objects, including directory entry cache and inode cache. And if I put a three in there, it's gonna do both slab objects and page cache. So let me pop D back out to where I was. So if I do this, Boy. Uh, this is going to drop all of the cached memory that is currently in use by the kernel. Now, let me take a look here, free. Uh, so you see this buffer cache. So if I do an echo three into drop caches, it is way smaller now. Yes. Okay. Nice. Four. All right. So the question was originally, what's the benefit? What's the detriment? What are the, yeah. What's the, what's hurting us here? Right. So the reason that we cache data, in fact, you'll notice that when you look at free uh, memory using the free command, the, the Linux kernel almost always like gobbles up whatever it can in cached memory. Yeah. So like you see the used and you'll see a very small free and you'll see a whole bunch of stuff over in cache. Mm -hmm. And you saw that originally, right? I have uh, about eight gigs of total memory. I was using about two. I only had one free and I was using four gigs for caching, right? But also available. Right. So cache memory counts also as available memory. But if you're just looking at free memory, cache memory doesn't count as free memory. So if needed- Confusing, but yes. <laughs> right. So if, if you're using uh, memory and you need to allocate more than you have in free, the kernel will automatically deallocate some of the cache to memory and then allocate it back to the process they're requesting. Um, so what we store in cache memory, why the kernel is cache hungry, is we're storing uh, lookup tables for things like directory entry cache or inodes. Uh, we're storing um, file writes that have been cached. We're storing file reads that have been cached because if somebody has asked for a file to be opened and read, what's the likelihood that something else is going to ask me for the same file to be opened and read, right? Or just a second ago, I was in the kernel documentation looking around, right? And I went, that was as I'm navigating this, the tab in bash was actually doing directory entry listings to like yeah. figure it out. Find the stuff for you. And all that stuff was cached. So the next time I do it, I may not have noticed that it has sped up, but it actually was sped up because it's pulling that information out of cache instead of actually having to go and spin the disk and, or in my case, look in the memory register on the NVMe to figure out what entries are in that directory. Um, and then here we were over here in this and I looked in the VM text and it's like, oh wait, the, the tunable wasn't in there. Well, let me check here. No, that's not right. Let me check. Maybe I just missed it. So when I opened the VM text originally, it was cached. 
And then I moved away from it. And now I came back to use it again. It is now hitting the cache instead of pulling that up from disk. And so that's the kind of stuff that we're storing in cache. Um, and the same thing for things like application stuff. Um, when applications open files or applications write files, what's the likelihood that it's, it's going to access that same file again? So we'll keep it in cache to try and speed those accesses up. So when you drop cache, um, you're ditching all of those saved bits of data. And then the next time we need to open that file, we actually have to spin the disk up, navigate the directory structure, find it, make sure our permissions are correct, allocate it, and show it to you. Um, so that's that's what you're doing by dropping the cache. You're just making us do all of those activities on the native operating system instead of being able to review the data that we've already loaded once in the memory for something that used it. So here's a question. Um, for a large, and there's multiple ways to say this, M malloc or malloc, uh, does the OS look into free or does it include cache too? Wouldn't it prevent apps from initiating itself because malloc doesn't have enough free memory? So the malloc request goes to the kernel and the kernel decides how to service it. Right. So if there's enough memory in free, then it just services that of free. Um, if there's not enough free memory to service it in free, then it looks to see whether if we combine some stuff from free and cache, if that would be enough memory. Right. And if so, then the kernel embarks on the journey of like removing data from cache, flushing data out of cache, returning that memory to the free and then performing the malloc request that was made. Um, right. So also it remember that, that we, until it swaps and we'll continue to do that until your swap is full. <laughs> right. And, and realize also that processes often over ask for memory. Oh, totally. right? we talk all the time, we, right? Right. Like they're trying to be safe, right? Yeah. Well, not just that, like they ask for things like shared memory or shared uh, libraries, which we've already got loaded, mm -hmm. but they account for that in their malloc requests. And so there's a whole bunch of things on like how we overcommit on RAM all the time. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that's one of the tunables um, here in the virtual memory tunables. Um, overcommit. So, yeah. uh, overcommit memory is a like zero, one, two. Uh, mm. Overcommit ratio is if you're in overcommit mode, how much will you overcommit to? All right. So, let's uh, just jump down to those. Um, So that's if you want to commit to a very specific part. All right. All right, so overcommit memory. Oops. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> all right, uh, so when it's zero, the kernel attempts to estimate the amount of free memory left on user space uh, when it allocates more memory. Mm -hmm. When it's one, the kernel pretends there's always enough memory, it'll never run out. So whatever is requested, that's what it's gonna give as an address space. Right, and realize the address space doesn't actually equate to real RAM used by the process. And then two is uh, never overcommit. So currently on this system and by default, we use setting zero. We, we guess um, and we'll overcommit up to a certain amount. Right. When would you ever enable, to, like when would you set it to two, never overcommit? Like, so there are like certain- That's gotta be a certain use case, right? Uh, there are certain, um, very conservative entities mm. that don't want to get in a situation where um, they need the memory and because they're out of memory, mm. oom killer starts and starts killing off their processes. Because that's what, if you're over committing memory, that's what could potentially be the case. And so there are certain um, uses where the architects of those applications have said, we're never going to overcommit memory because I don't want to risk having Oom killer start up to kill off processes on my box. Right. And so another question from Farhan, isn't overcommit somewhat contradicting swappiness? And I don't know if it's contradicting, but it definitely affects you know how much swap would be used. If you even have swap, because a lot of times swap so, is not there. <laughs> swappiness. 
because I think a lot of people don't um, know what swappiness actually sets. Mm. Entirely possible. Okay, so swappiness. Well, this is, swappiness is definitely something that I've tuned for DB servers. Otherwise. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and in fact, <laughs> it's it's I think one of the most commonly tuned uh, yes. things. Yeah. All right, so it's a value between zero and one hundred. Mm -hmm. which sets the kernel's affinity for utilizing swap space. So it will always utilize swap space. Right. It's just how aggressive should it be at filling up that swap space? So at 100, it should try to swap whenever it can, whatever data it can. Right. And at zero, it should try to never, never. swap as much as possible, but it will still swap. And there's actually been, um, I think in row... It was either rel six or rel seven. There was a change to swap where uh, zero does not disable it, and that's that's a misunderstanding right. a lot. People yes. think if you said to zero, disable it. That's not true. No, that's not true. It's still um, enabled. It's just trying not to use it as right. hard as it can. Yeah, and it being the kernel. Yeah, the the kernel actually got a commit. Um, I can't remember if it was rel six or rel seven time frame mm -hmm. where specifically it addresses the value of zero for swappiness where it says up until this amount of memory is left, and it's actually like a number in bytes, the kernel won't swap. However, that number is very small. And so it, it was put in there to effectively disable swap space, but that's not what this parameter does. This parameter right. sets, your, sets your affinity for using it. So really it's like setting a rule that says until you've gotten to this like really tiny amount of free RAM that's left, don't swap. Don't. But once you hit this really tiny amount, then swap away. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So once upon a time, people were like, oh, set to zero, turn off swapping. No. Wrong. That's what swap off is for. <laughs> right. The other thing is like, oh, set to zero, the kernel will uh, almost never swap. Okay, that's that's pretty true. Yeah. Uh, however, now, because of that change, uh, it doesn't swap un up until this like very tiny sliver of RAM is left. Mm. And there are now cases where if memory usage is going up a lot, mm -hmm. then what will happen is the kernel will realize that it needs to start swapping because it's crossed that threshold. However, all the memory is now used which means there's no memory left to actually do swapping. Right. <laughs> so it works great in places where like memory usage is uh, consistent or smaller allocations of memory are what's happening on the machine. And the places where it's like disaster world is Java applications or sometimes enterprise database applications because when they allocate stuff, they allocate huge amounts of memory at a time. And so all of a sudden you cross over that threshold where you need to be like, oh, I need to swap. But you've crossed over it because you've just allocated the last bit of RAM that you had on the system. So you're done. And the system will essentially like hang. It's, I think those use cases are extraordinarily rare. Uh, but what you'll see is uh, when someone recommends that you tune swappiness, and they want you to be really conservative with swappiness, they will now have you set it to one instead of having you set it to zero. Because at swappiness one, you're equally unlikely to utilize swap space, or pr pretty darn close to equally unlikely to using swap right. space. But there's not this like artificial boundary at which you can cross to utilize swap space. So that boundary limitation is removed. So you're unlikely to use it unless you're very memory constrained. There's no actual listed amount of memory that you have to have in order to start using swap. All right. There's a ton of questions here. Or okay. There's two of them. All right. <laughs> From the same person. I shouldn't say a ton. Sorry. Um, how does overcommit affect swappiness? If we set swappiness to a high value and have set the overcommit, would it fail to swap because theoretically all the memory could be committed? Okay, so overcommitment of memory means that processes ask for more than they're going to use. Right. Right. So no, we're not actually using that memory. 
It's just we told the process that if it wanted it, because it asked for it, it had it. And so it's like, uh, I'll explain overcommitment like this. Uh, when you're when you're dealing with a child, it's like, Daddy, I want to go to Disney World. Okay, kiddo. Good luck. What well, one day, <laughs> one day we'll go to Disney World. Yeah. Right? Did you actually commit to a date on which you are attending Disney World? Mm-mm. No. But you've told them that one day that'll happen. And so at some point in the future, they're gonna be like, are we going to Disney World now? We're doing this now. <laughs> right. And, and then you can decide whether you're going to do it or not going to do it. Right. And overcommitting memory is the same, right? The, the process starts up and goes, I need 37 million gigs of RAM. Okay. And you're like, sure. That's a hell of Here's an EC2 bill. But th- yeah. 37 million gigs of RAM. There you go, process. Have at it. Right. And really the process then uses like the first 400K. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's what you're actually committed as. Yeah. Um, and at some point in the future, when that process goes, ah, I need my other 400 gig of RAM, blam, 400 million gig of RAM, and it actually tries to store stuff there, that's when you actually have to deal with that overcommitment. Right. So, okay. uh, so I don't think there's a, a relationship between overcommitment and swappiness because swapping is actual memory that's been stored is now being paged out to the swap spaces. And there's actually a very specific list of things that will be eligible for swap. Mm -hmm. Um, So things like anonymous process data is eligible. Wait, yes, is eligible for swap. Um, But things like shared shared libraries are not eligible for swap because other things might be using it too. Um, So if you don't have a lot of the eligible things for swap, there's nothing for us to do. Right. All right. Cool. Question answered. Good job. So um, let's take a look at this mm-hmm. Microsoft um, guide here. Let me grab that. Mm-hmm. And uh, short, do you want me to share it on my screen or do you um, want me to just talk to it? <clears throat> Your call, man. If you want to share it on screen, go ahead. If you don't feel like doing the screen herky jerky, you don't have to. Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Okay. All right. One second. Let me uh screen sharing swapping music. Yay. <laughs> I do need a theme song for this. I can just start da, da, on. Da, da. It's like half Jeopardy, half circus, right? Like that's what I'm thinking. What are you saying? It was circus <laughs> of swapping, screen swapping. Sometimes it can be. All right. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share the whole screen now. Oh boy. Oh, see what um, happens. Okay. All right. Doesn't look terrifying. Cool. So I think that uh, Microsoft did a pretty good job on this article about how to configure Linux and start talking about things like self arrayed, which you may or may not be using, partitioning recommendations, file system tuning. But the stuff that we're interested in talking about proc today is down a little bit further where it starts talking about, okay, in your tune D, mm profile this is what you want to have in there and specifically all this stuff is in proxys yeah this this is good stuff right here right right um and so what it's giving you is kind of the directory location and tunable file Mm -hmm. and then what the value should be in that file and so you'll notice what we're just talking about right swapping this is set to one yep because they want to swap as little as possible. Because uh, databases, I, yeah. I remember arguing uh, the zero and one thing in the past at previous companies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, granted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what they want to do is they want to avoid swappiness as much as, as possible. That's where they're setting it to have the affinity very low for utilizing it. Um, because a lot of the data that is stored by the SQL um, processes is cached data, yeah. which is stored in anonymous process data, which normally would be eligible for swapping. And so if you swapped that data out, now the database process is trying to hit its cache, thinking it's going to be fast. And in reality, you've now kicked off this like, 
swap in operation off of slow storage device, mm-hmm. which is not fast. And that causes application problems. Right. Like any, any disk is going to be slower than memory by an order of magnitude. So that's why swappiness is important for databases because you kind of want your whole database to fit in memory. <laughs> well, there are some databases like SAP yeah. HANA where mm. that's absolutely true. All mm. the database is in memory for SAP HANA. Yeah. Uh, for others like SQL Server, that's not always the case, but they prefer to have that be the case. Right. Yeah. Um, and then there's sometimes where that's just not possible, right? You, you have this enormous database on yep. disk, but you want the parts that you use a lot to be in yeah. memory. You want that to be snappy, yeah. Right. And um, so like swapping Like sharding, for example, right? Like you want to make sure that, you know, where you're sharding is appropriate performance-wise. I said shard. Don't giggle. Sorry, it's just like duty. (laughs) I know. All right. Um, So the other parameters they're changing here. Uh, So here, the dirty, vm.dirty whatever, um, they're making changes to how we flush disk writes hmm. and um, yeah, that's mostly it. How we flush disk writes because disk writes are stored as dirty pages in page cache and they have a time on how long they can exist in page cache before they have to be synced out to the disk. Um, and so here they're saying the ratio of dirty pages needs to be 80%, right? Which is like a lot of cache disk writes. Yeah. Um, and then we will expire those dirty pages after 500 centiseconds. So they can actually persist in memory for five seconds before they're eligible to be written, mm-hmm. which in computer time is like really long. A long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then dirty write back. I can't remember what write back uh, is. But if we went into the VM text file for the kernel doc, I bet it's in there and we can read mm-hmm. what it is. Um, so again, they're like, trying to keep data in memory longer. So All right. yeah, we've got a minute and a half left and there's a link in here that I think you want to share. Oh, the, uh, well, there's two. Well, there's so, two, but. Yeah, so the, the other one that, that I'll go to real quick. So I think this is a good example of a tuning doc. They actually go through and like tell you why they're asking you to make the changes. Mm-hmm. The not so good tuning doc. Uh, and that one's pretty good too. There we go. The not so good tuning doc is this one. I already put it in the chat. Oh, thank you. No um, where they go, okay, make these changes. Well, if you actually look at what these changes are, they're talking about the shared memory maximums on the system, right? How much memory can be used for shared memory, um, as well as how many semaphores and the size of semaphores and the number of semaphores you have for inter-process communication. But when you're dealing with memory and how much memory should be allocated to a certain thing, don't you need to know how much memory is on the system to make those changes? Yeah, you got to make some math happen there. (laughs) Right. And so there's a lot, a lot, a lot of tuning guides that'll do things like this. And, um, like you want to be really wary of those because mm-hmm. clearly they're not saying if you have this much memory, you need to set these value to this. If you have right. this much more memory, you need to be setting it to something different. So they're not accounting for the actual memory that you have on systems. So how do you know that these are even right for the box that you're deploying? All right. Um, and then, so maybe we need to do a follow-up on this one, I don't know, in a month or two months yeah. or something. Um, but you're right, Chris, there was one link that I wanted to talk about before we close out the show. I'll drop it now. Uh, so do you want to do my job? <laughs> uh, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Can you do it better than me? That's, that's the other important thing. Hmm. Uh, so my team is hiring at Red Hat and we're hiring um, more technical marketing managers, which is what I do and what Chris does. Well, I do, yeah. um, and so if you're interested in working at Red Hat and you can think you can do our job, maybe even better than us, 
please. Have at it. Yeah. So there's a great group of TMMs here. We're all pretty tightly knit, I think. You know, I mean, we work across BUs pretty well, I feel like, you know, in most cases. Um, it's, it's just really fun time, right? Like you get to be part of, you know, the technical side and bringing, you know, solutions to people and then also part of like the larger marketing machine sometimes, which, you know, it's things like this, OpenShift TV and OpenShift Commons and you know, all those things. It's good stuff. And doing webinars and convergence events. And yeah. One day, and one day we'll do again. Summit again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, oh, speaking of Summit. Uh, yeah, please. You know, uh, Summit is going to be an awesome, like, three-part event this year. And we're hoping that third part is somewhat physical. Uh, so check out the, the Summit page. I just dropped a link in chat. If you're interested, sign up to attend. You know, we'd greatly appreciate it if you did. Um, but yeah, Summit is our big uh, annual event. And we're kind of splitting it up for 2021 to make it a little bit more consumable. We don't want to do the full, like, week-on experience uh, virtually because we know that people are fatigued from everything is virtual. <laughs> Right, like, oh, I'm meeting with my family on Zoom later. Great, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah, I actually uh, have a D and D group that I play with, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I had to be like, guys, this is too much like work now. Like, I just can't. Right. Let's, like, I'll, I'm in when we go back to in person, but I right. just can't right now. Yeah, it's I've I've gotten to the point where it's like, yeah, it's cool to do like a group call every once in a while, but. I'm really not looking forward to sitting in this chair 24 seven, right? Like that, that's not the goal of me working, right? Like I want to use Zoom for work and very little else. You don't want to work to Zoom? <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. It's nothing, nothing against Zoom, right? Like it's a great product, yeah. uh, but it's just, I prefer to have time not on the computer. <laughs> I hear you. Keeps me sane. All right. Great show, man. Oh, this, thanks for. I think that we got a lot of great questions too. So yeah, thank you, audience, for tuning in and sharing the time with us. Indeed. Thanks, everybody, and uh, see you in a couple weeks. Yeah, two weeks from now, same bet time, same bet channel, unless you go through DST and then things change. <laughs> <laughs> it has already happened here, so we're in that wonky. The rest of the world is turning over. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, that's all for the channel today. Tune in tomorrow morning. First thing, we're going to be talking about storage, uh, talking about live migrations from OpenShift Container Storage 3 to 4. I'm going to do that on the fly. We'll see how well that goes in an hour-long show. Hopefully, it'll be okay. <laughs> you never know with storage, right? Never know. Never know. All right. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. Stay safe out there. Thank you, Scott, as always. <laughs>